Sape satta bhavantu sukhitatta bhavantu sukhitatta Hello, I am Dave Jacobson and I'm here with the eighth episode of Nibbana, the secret treasure of the Buddhas. Now why do I say it's a secret? It's only because there's so much misunderstanding about Nibbana. And uh, this series is probably going to go for hundreds of episodes. <laughs> I have so much material. And why is it possible to say so much about something that, by definition, cannot be put into words? <laughs> it's a paradox, isn't it? Well, not really. Because while Nibbana itself may be impossible to express in words, the approach or the understanding of Nibbana is certainly possible to discuss. And in addition, we have so many misunderstandings of Nibbana that we need to expose and explain away so that uh, you can open up a path to the actual experience of Nibbana. I say it's an experience, but actually it's not an experience because there's no experiencer. There's all kinds of paradoxes connected with Nibbana, and that's okay. It should be a paradoxical state. It should be an inexplicable state. But we can talk about the path. We can talk about the understanding that opens up that path. And we can talk about the wrong understandings that block the path and keep people from attaining it. So this is what's going on in the world today. One of my friends... I use the term friend in the Facebook sense. <laughs> uh, actually, we're not very close, but he's a psychiatrist from New York. Now he's retired, but when he was practicing, he was very well known and had lots of journal articles and so on. But he was miserable. And the reason he was miserable is he had a terrible childhood, a horrific childhood. And... He struggled with these childhood issues uh, for his whole life. And as far as I know, he's still struggling with them. But he decided a long time ago that psychiatry or psychology was not going to help him. And he took up meditation. So every summer he goes to Thailand for at least at 25 years that I know of. He went every summer to the rains retreat in Thailand in a monastery and he meditated for a whole month intensively hours and hours every day and here we are 25 years later is he over his childhood issues no has he attained enlightenment no not really he might be a little more thoughtful a little more aware than he was before but he still is at the mercy of his emotions and gets triggered very, very easily. So what has he done in 25 years? 25 years! Well, he's been following the wrong path. He's been following a philosophy that doesn't really come from the Buddha's teaching, that comes from Thai academic scholars and has been taken up by certain monks who teach meditation as a system, and, uh, you know, I'm famously skeptical about systems because they're all abstractions. Nyanananda, one time I tried to discuss with him the pa Auk system, and I couldn't even get the words out of my mouth before he said, no systems! <laughs> no systems. Either you take the Buddha's teaching as a whole, as it is, or it's going to be very difficult to get the result. So these systems that take one sutta or one approach to enlightenment and try to make it everything are basically compromises for beginners. And that might be good in the beginning of practice so you don't have too many things going on. Just focus on one thing and get it really, really well. Now that's all right. But when it stretches on and on and on, 
you know, if someone is sitting and meditating for two, three, five years, ten years, and they're not getting the result, something is wrong. So let's look at some of the things that went wrong with understanding the meaning of Nibbana. So first of all, what does the word mean? Well, we went over in the previous few videos about Nama Rupa. Nama Rupa is a very important term in the Buddha's teaching. It's one of the principal stages, one of the early stages of the process of dependent origination, but Ticca Sambhupada. Mm. But the scholars distorted the meaning because they wanted to show off, basically, I think. It's pretty clear, pretty obvious that Nama means name and Rupa means form. But they wanted to introduce some fancy etymological analysis of word roots and twist the meaning into something much more complicated and indirect. So this done the same thing with Nibbana. Nibbana basically means extinguishing, going out, like when a fire goes out, when a fire is extinguished. Sometimes it's translated as extinction, which comes across in English a little bit differently, more like uh, ceasing to exist. And that has a, a ring of truth to it, but uh, it's really not a very good translation. It's more similar to extinguishing as a fire. But what do the scholars say? They say, uh, Nibbana is called like that because it is an exit from craving, which is a form of weaving. What? <laughs> this is scholarship for you, huh? They want to show off their knowledge of etymology, word roots, and so on. And so they dig down into the particles of the word and they come up with all these explanations that have actually nothing to do with it. So how do you get weaving? Well, the particle vana, or the word root vana, can also mean weaving. And they trans then they say the, the prefix ni means to go out, to exit. So nibbana means exit from weaving. I don't know where they get this stuff. Well, actually, I do know where they get it. They get it from Shankaracharya. Shankaracharya was an Indian philosopher and yogi. And he wanted to bring some of the viewpoints of Buddhism into Hinduism. Unfortunately, he misinterpreted the Buddha's teaching as nihilism, belief in nothing. So he wanted to instead turn it into a belief in everything <laughs> because Hinduism is positivist. So he uh, invented this idea that it's all one. And then he proceeded to interpret various Hindu scriptures, Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Purana, and most famously the Vedanta Sutra. Uh, in the light of his philosophy, the only problem is all those works are dualist. <laughs> so how did he get, for example, Vedanta Sutta to support his idea that it's all one, monism? Well, he cheated. He went back to the word roots. And of course, in Sanskrit, each root has a variety of meanings derived from uh, its original meaning. And so he took these various meanings and, and sort of stuck them together and changed the dictionary definition of the words. Now, to me, this is a very serious matter because if we're going to communicate, it means that I have an idea in my mind and I'm going to encode it in a certain language. And the key to that code is the dictionary. I have an idea and I want to use words to describe it, so I look up in the dictionary which words are appropriate for that concept and I put them into sentences, hopefully, <laughs> and transmit them by some medium to a person who's hearing and they hear this code, this language, and they use their dictionary to decode the language into its concepts and hopefully they get something close to the original idea. 
but because people don't use the dictionary, <laughs> language breaks down. If you've ever played that game called telephone, where you sit in a circle at a party and somebody takes a short phrase written down on a piece of paper. They don't show it to anybody, but they whisper it into the ear of the next person. And then by the time you go around a circle, 10 or 12 people, it comes out something completely different. Well, how is that? Because they're not aware of the dictionary meaning of the terms. So they change it a little bit each time until by the time you get to the end of the circle, it's completely different. Well, this is what happens also in spirituality, in religion, in uh, the Buddha's teaching as well. What happens is people will change the meaning subtly because of their personal agenda, whatever it might be. So Shankaracharya was trying to prove monism, oneness, out of scriptures that are firmly dualistic. So how could he do it? The only way he could do it is to change the meaning of the words, to twist the meaning. So when these uh, South Indian monks came to Sri Lanka early in the Buddha Sasana, they used the same techniques and they changed the meaning of the roots to alter the definitions of the words to show what great scholars they were because that was the actual criteria in India. So instead of illuminating the meaning, they obscured it instead. And this is going on. This is why uh, it's so hard to understand Nibbana. One of the reasons why. I mean, Nibbana is already hard to understand just by its nature, even if you know the correct understanding. So if you start to twist the words around, then it just becomes impossible. And of course, the monks, most of the monks now don't study the original suttas. They study the commentaries instead. And so they get a completely wrong idea. No wonder they're not obtaining enlightenment. No wonder they're not experiencing Nibbana. So let's see what the Buddha says about Nibbana. Uh, for example, in the Ratana Sutta, he says, Nibbanti dhira yatayam padipo. Those wise ones get extinguished even like this lamp. And there's also uh, similar examples in many different suttas. So the images of a lamp being extinguished by being blown out and so on. And there's also some nice stories about monks who attained enlightenment upon seeing the extinguishing of a lamp. So, just like the Buddha, when he attained enlightenment, he saw Venus in the morning sky gradually fade until it was invisible. And this brought him to a state of realization. So similarly, extinguishing a lamp or a fire can have the same effect. Well, let's look into this a little bit more. The Buddha uh, presents a Socratic dialogue in one of his suttas, the Agivachakota Sutta, giving this simile in more detail. He says, What do you think, Vacha? If a fire were burning in front of you, would you know that this fire is burning in front of me? Yes. The Buddha continues, And suppose someone were to ask you, Vacha, this fire burning in front of you, dependent on what is it burning? Thus ask, how would you reply? I would reply, this fire burning in front of me is burning dependent on grass and wood as its sustenance. Okay, the Buddha says, if the fire burning in front of you were to go out, would you know that the fire burning in front of me has gone out? Yes. And then the Buddha hits the punchline. <laughs> and suppose someone were to ask you, this fire has gone out in front of you. In which direction from here has it gone? East, west, north, or south? Thus asked, how would you reply? And Vacha has a little realization. And he says, that doesn't apply, Master Gotama. Any fire 
burning dependent on a sustenance of grass and timber, being unnourished from having consumed that sustenance and not being offered any other, is classified simply as out. And the word that is translated out actually means unbound, disconnected. In other words, when you bring together fuel and fire, it burns, and you have a fire. So when that fuel is exhausted, the fire goes out. But where does it go? Well, it doesn't go anywhere. It's extinguished. It's finished. It has used up all its nutriment, its nourishment, its fuel. So similarly, name and form of our old friends, Nama Rupa, are fuel for the fire of life. What is burning? When, when you have a fire, what is burning? Is the fire burning or is the wood burning? How can you separate them? The fire and the wood together are a fire. I should say maybe the flames and the wood together make a fire. If you separate them, there's no more fire. Let's say if you have a match or a candle and you blow it out, what's happened? You, you have blown the flame away from its sustenance and so immediately goes out. When the sustenance is removed, the fire automatically is extinguished. Similarly, when name and form is removed from our consciousness, the fire of material existence goes away. It just goes away. It doesn't go anywhere. It just ceases. See, this is dependent origination. Dependent origination is the principle of particular causality, that when this cause is here, this effect is there. And when this cause goes away, the effect also disappears. So what you have in the, in the case of fire, for example, is that the wood is the cause, and the oxidation of the wood or the fire is the effect. And when the uh, two are separated, or when the wood is used up, and the fuel is gone, the fire goes out. I'm going to say it once again. Name and form are the fuel for the fire of becoming that leads to suffering. Because we become attached to the fire. We become identified with the fire. We say, the fire is me. And then at the end, when the fire goes out, when the fuel is exhausted, we suffer. So to be delivered from the fire of life, the fire of becoming, the fire of the world. Huh? There's a nice sutta called the, the fire sutta, the fire sermon, where the Buddha says, this world is a flame. The body is a flame. The senses and the mind are a flame. They're burning up. They're oxidizing. You can see it. If you were to take a picture of this house, let's say, every day for 20 or 30 years without doing anything to the house, you would see it gradually oxidize and fall apart. And if you were to make it into a movie, within a few minutes you could see the whole 20 years go by and how the thing becomes destroyed. It's a flame. It's burning. It's oxidizing. It's just not burning fast enough that we can see the flames. It's happening slowly. So similarly, this body, this mind, these senses are all aflame. They're burning. And within a few years, the fuel is going to be used up. What is the fuel? The name and form that began this process, this fabrication of a being. And when that original impetus, that original cause, disappears or is used up, then the whole thing collapses. And this is what happens at the end of life. So one way to look at the process of meditation is as a simulation of the process of death. 
we deliberately enter into the uh, cessation of the process of becoming so that we know what's going to happen at the time of death. We're familiar with it. We can deal with it. We make it our friend. We see how it opens up new possibilities that weren't there before. And the most important of these possibilities is the possibility of Nibbana, of going into the emptiness, going into the nothingness, the extinction, the extinguishing of death, and being okay with it, being at home in it, taking refuge in it, taking rest in it, and coming out again refreshed and new. Sabbe Satta Bhavantu Sukhitatta Bhavantu Sukhitatta